Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Tonight, it looks like we've got the uh, three stooges together up here. Curly, Larry, and Moe. We're going to be uh, talking about something tonight that none of us really know a hell of a lot about. (laughs) Not sex. That only fits Tim's category. We're not quite into that yet. <clears throat> we thought what we would like to do tonight, we spent uh, three or four days here talking about the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, <clears throat> talking about the thing we call the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, talking about it in the application of our lives on a personal basis, so that we could recover from this hopeless condition of the mind and of the body called alcoholism. But we know that AA is made up of a lot more than just the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. We know we also have a thing called the traditions. We know that we also have a thing called the service structure, And we know those traditions and that service structure, the same as the 12 steps, were left to us as legacies from the first people in Alcoholics Anonymous. A legacy being something that has been left to you by people who have gone on before you. We know that in AA we have a logo, which is a circle with a triangle inside the circle. And we don't think that that's there just by accident. The triangle being supposedly the strongest structure that you can possibly have. And Bill placed his triangle inside that circle, and there he put the three legacies of Alcoholics Anonymous. On the bottom of that triangle, we have the first legacy called recovery. And we know that that legacy was given to us in 1939 in the big book Alcoholics Anonymous, the 12-step program of recovery. We know that one side of that triangle (laughs) is what we call unity. And as we dig into this a little deeper tonight, we will find that unity, the 12 traditions, was given to us some years later by those first members of Alcoholics Anonymous. We know that the third side of the triangle is called service. (laughs) You're getting getting smarter now, isn't (laughs) it? And we know that that was given to us some years later by the original people in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I don't think it's by accident that recovery is on the bottom because recovery supports the other two sides of the triangle. And I think one of the greatest mistakes that's being made in AA today is many of us are trying to practice unity without recovery first 
And many of us are being involved in the service structure without recovery first. And it's almost impossible to practice unity and service without some humility. And humility seems to be gained through the program of recovery. It's almost impossible to have unity within an AA group unless we have recovery as the base of the group. And it's usually easy to tell which group has recovery and which doesn't. Because when you go into a group that has no recovery, you usually find them fighting with each other, raising hell with each other, <coughs> gossiping about each other, very, very critical of each other. And that's because there's no recovery at the basis of that group. And it's nearly impossible to practice unity without recovery first. It's very easy to go into one of our service areas and determine whether there's recovery there or not. Because it's hard to do good service work and practice the tolerance and patience needed for in service work unless you've got recovery at the base of it. So I don't think it's by accident that recovery is the basis. Now, some of the highlights of our AA history, we've already talked about them to a certain extent. and We'll kind of discuss them a little and as we go along tonight. We know that one of the beginning points of our whole fellowship was when Ebby visited with Bill and tells Bill his story in the latter part of November of 1934. And as we've already talked, Bill went into the town's hospital in the early part of December. After withdrawal, he applied the little practical program of action from the Oxford groups and had his spiritual experience in December of 1934. We know that from December through May, Bill did his best to work with other alcoholics in New York City, knowing that if he was to keep what he had, he would have to give it away. But as we saw before in Bill's story, he wasn't successful with any of them primarily because he talked to them about his great white flash that he had had in that hospital. He talked to them about the need for spiritual recovery, but he never did tell them what was wrong with them. And as we talked in Bill's story, one day while back in the town's hospital, visiting with Dr. Silkworth, he asked him about this. And he said, I've been trying to help other people and none seem to want what I have. And the doctor said to Bill, why don't you tell them what I told you? He said, every alcoholic I know wants to know two things. One, why can't I drink without getting drunk? And two, why can't I quit now that I want to quit? And he said, if you will explain to them the hopeless condition of the mind and of the body, then you'll get their interest. And then you can talk to them about spirituality. And we know it's not by accident that Bill visited with Dr. Bob in May of 1935. And for the first time, he tried that out. And he explained to Dr. Bob the exact nature of his illness. Dr. Bob bought into it immediately and began to practice the program of the Oxford groups to a depth he never had before. And after one more drunk, he recovered never to drink again. In June the 10th, 1935, he had that last drink in the parking lot of the hospital, that, can, that bottle of beer, no cans in those days. And that was the beginning of Alcoholics Anonymous. And of course, those two people, two people were considered to be the co-founders. Probably if Ebby had stayed sober, he would have been considered as a co-founder. But we know some years later, Ebby found it necessary to drink some more. 
1937, the New York AAs separated from the Oxford groups. In 1937, the meeting was held there in Akron that determined the writing of the Big Book Alcoholics Anonymous. And the group in Akron did not want to separate from the Oxford groups at that time. So they continued as members of the Oxford groups. Those in New York City were just known as drunks who were trying to recover. We also know that in 1938, John Rockefeller gave us the $5,000, and the people were very disappointed because they expected much more. And Mr. Rockefeller said, don't come back to me for money anymore. This is all I'm going to let you have. And he said, I really believe money would destroy this outfit. Thank God that Mr. Rockefeller had that idea. The $5,000 went primarily to Bill and Bob to help support them to a certain extent while trying to get this thing off the ground. And as John showed us in the beginning, it was eventually paid back by the fellowship. In 1938, since they had made this decision to write the big book, since they knew there was going to be a lot of money coming in, they decided there had to be some vehicle to handle and control and take care of that money. They knew that if they tried to do it within their groups, that it would destroy them surely. So they formed a thing in 1938 called the Alcoholic Foundation. And if my memory serves me correct, there was five people on that foundation. And the purpose of the foundation was to take over the legal function, to handle the monies, to do the things necessary business-wise. It was incorporated in the state of New York, and it was decided to keep all of that business out of the AA meetings themselves, let the corporation handle it, the foundation. In 1938, Bill began to write the big book Alcoholics Anonymous, and somewhere throughout that year and the early part of 1939, they completed the Big Book Alcoholics Anonymous. The actual 12 steps were written either in December or the early part of 1939. In April of 1939, the book Alcoholics Anonymous was published. And the date it was published was the date that we were given our first legacy. And we know that 100 people had recovered by that time through this information contained in the big book Alcoholics Anonymous. We also know that shortly thereafter, AA began to grow by leaps and bounds. We also know that many, many people began to recover from this hopeless condition of the mind and body called alcoholism. Now, we believe today that one of the reasons that they were so good at recovering from that little disease is because they had a program of action, and that program of action was to take people who were absolute emotional basket cases, who were spiritually, physically, and morally bankrupt, who couldn't get along with anybody, period, much less themselves, and to start producing some form of stability within their lives so that they would be able to stay sober and feel good enough to keep that sobriety, to give them some form of emotional stability within their lives so that it wouldn't be necessary to go back to drinking from time to time. 
Now, I'm not sure whether Bill really realized it at the time he wrote the steps. But we've been able to see this weekend as we've gone through them a certain pattern in the writing of the steps. Let's review that for just a moment. We see here the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. Go with you, give me some water, please. And as you've heard us talking for the last three or four days, we believe that step one tells us what our problem really is, powerless. And if we have a problem in order to recover from it, we'll have to have a solution. And if the problem is powerless, then the solution is power. Now, after we once see the solution, then it's going to be necessary to know how do you find that solution. And we've been able to see where Bill took the little practical program of action the tenets of the Oxford groups and expanded them into some steps that we refer to as action steps, with the purpose of the action steps being designed to let us find that solution. Now, each one of these steps has a certain idea or a certain action within the step itself. Let's very briefly review what that action would be. Joe, would you talk just for a moment about step three? Step three. <laughs> 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 Damn good step, isn't good. it? Huh? <laughs> you see, we never know what we're going to do in this, and that's where we get our fun out of this, too. See, I'm supposed to have three. But see, they used to take it away from me. They give it back to me. I didn't know I had He's it. confused tonight. We've got him mixed up. Okay. Since our action is initiated with a decision, step three is the beginning of the recovery program. You know, all action is born in decision. Good, and it's good. in step three, based on one and two, because of what we see in one and two, we make a decision to turn our will and our life for care of God. If we are powerless and we want this power, then we have to turn over our will, which is our power. And this is the beginning of the action. Very little action involved in step three, but of course we use the prayer and took a little bit of action in step three. John, what's the action in step four? In order to validate the decision process, we make a fact-finding and fact-facing, truthful, written list of ourselves. This is the first tangible evidence, really, of our, of our recovery process, and really, in fact, validates the decision that we made. First action step. So the action involved there is the taking of the inventory. What's the action in step five, Joe? Once we gather this information, uh, in order to improve on this information, we talk to God, to ourselves, and another human being about it, trying to get a deeper, a better picture of the information that we have gathered in step four. So our action involved there, we're dealing primarily with admission to another human being. And from that feedback, to give us more information. What's the exact action involved in six, John? Step six. <laughs> <laughs> Have I ever had step six before? Then? No. Oh. Two. Step six is a, to develop an attitude of being entirely ready to have God remove the defects of character. Developing an attitude of being entirely willing and ready. All right. The action here is a thing we call willingness. As we could see today, if we don't have it, we pray until we get it. What's the action involved in seven, Joe? 
having become willing to let go of these things, we ask God to remove them in step seven. Okay, the action implied is the removal of those shortcomings, of course, through prayer. How about the action in eight, John? Step eight is the beginning of our relationship to clean up the wreckage of the past, and we make a list of people we have harmed. What's the action in nine, Joe? In step nine, we make direct amends to such people and clear up our relationship with other people. Okay, one making the list, the other one making the actual amends. Now, there's also an action involved in ten, which we haven't really talked about yet. What would be the action in ten? You continue to do everything that you've done up until this time on a daily basis. <laughs> That's good. That's great. That really uh -huh. is great. <laughs> continue to take that inventory. And we're going to find tomorrow as we begin to look at it, step 10 would involve all of the actions taken from 4 through 9 on a daily basis through the continuation of this inventory. What's the action in 11, Joe? Eleven is the final action. Through prayer and meditation, we receive God's will. In step three, we made a decision to turn over our will. And then in steps four through ten, we cleared away the thing that blocked us. And now in step eleven, we complete the process by receiving God's will. And this is the, the, the final step of action as far as our growth. So through the seeking of God's will in step eleven, we receive God's will back in our life. Now, I think it's very easy to see that each one of those steps from 3 through 11 does entail an action of some kind. Now, the result of that action, of course, will be given to us in step 12. Having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, we are guaranteed a certain result if we will take those action steps and make them a part of our life, we're guaranteed to have a spiritual awakening. And a spiritual awakening, of course, is the personality change sufficient to recover from that hopeless condition of the mind and body known as alcoholism. So I think it's quite easy to say that this rhythm here won the problem to the solution, 3 through 11 being the action resulting in a spiritual awakening, will give us what we like to refer to as emotional sobriety. Now, there's all kinds of sobriety. There's a little bit of sobriety. There's short-term sobriety. There's dry sobriety. There's white-knuckle sobriety. And most of us have employed and tried those kinds of sobriety, and really we don't get a hell of a lot out of it. But if we will use the 12-step program, and if we will receive the spiritual awakening, then we will be emotionally sober. You know, if I don't use this program in my life, I may be dry, I may be sober, but under those conditions, I'm just about as drunk emotionally as I ever was drunk physically when I was drinking alcohol. And to be sober and not be able to enjoy it, to be sober and to be an emotional basket case is really not very good as far as living is concerned. And to be sober and not have emotional sobriety usually leads us right back to drinking. So we can see that the steps are designed not just to get us sober and keep us sober. They are designed to give us that emotional sobriety so that we can stay sober and be happy about it at the same time. And they never fail for those that really try them. Today we know that within our fellowship we have approximately 2 million people sober on this first legacy. Hopefully they will all eventually work it and be able to keep decent sobriety in their life. We have no idea how many millions have recovered and already died and gone on before us. 
from the first 40, from the first 100, this legacy has given us recovery throughout the entire world. Now, as these people begin to sober up, and as the fellowship began to grow, way back in the early 1940s, as the fellowship got bigger and bigger, the problems began to multiply. Because we began to put certain rules on people coming into AA. Some groups had rules concerning membership. Some groups had rules concerning who's going to run the group and who isn't. Some groups had rules regarding who is the authority and who isn't. Some groups wanted to get into the alcoholism recovery field and did. Some groups wanted a lot of newspaper and, at that time, film coverage. Some groups wanted to promote AA. Some groups could see no reason for being self-supporting. And as the fellowship grew and these different ideas began to expand, AA began to tear itself apart from within. And after a period of time, Bill began to see the need for a set of principles that could be used at the group level to give to the group the same thing that the steps gave to the individual, emotional sobriety. You know, we can come together in a group and we can be just as drunk emotionally, collectively, as we can be drunk emotionally as an individual or as we can actually be drunk physically, collectively, or as an individual. And I begin to see that if we didn't do something about some of these things, that sooner or later we would destroy ourselves through the fighting and the various things going on within the fellowship. Now, Bill began to think about and talk about these principles back in the early 1940s. He began to receive letters from different people and different groups all over the country. And those letters would be telling about a certain thing that had taken place in that group and what the terrible results were of that particular thing, whatever it might be. Bill began to write letters and correspond with people and ask them, do you have any rules in your group? And if so, what are they? And one of the things that we seem to have the greatest difficulty with was this thing concerning the membership of Alcoholics Anonymous. Remember coming out of the Oxford groups, they wanted upstanding members of the community so that people would look at the Oxford groups and say, oh, those are really great people over there. Kind of filtered into AA. And the members were quite concerned about what the public in general would think about us if we didn't have the right kind of people in AA. They began to worry about what they would think if we had somebody in here who might be a criminal or an ex-convict. They begin to worry about what the public would think of us if we had women in our fellowship who were ex-prostitutes and things like that. And most of these groups begin to apply rules regarding membership. At one time, Bill canvassed the entire fellowship to get their membership rules. When he got them back and read them all, he said to his amazement and amusement, he found that he nor Dr. Bob either one could be members if all the rules were in force at the same time. <laughs> now, he began to develop these ideas and the normal fellowship or organization might have wanted to call them the rules of conduct. But Bill knew that you wasn't about to use the word rules with alcoholics. So he searched around for a better word to describe them. And he finally came up with the word traditions, which have no 
force behind them to enforce them, but which perhaps those people would begin to accept within the fellowship itself. And as soon as you begin to write these things and ask people information and ask them about what they thought of them, he ran into the same stone wall that he ran into with the twelve steps. They said, what the hell do we need rules for? And who are you to tell us what we can do and what we can't do? And I don't care if you do have an office in New York City. You're not about to tell us what we're going to do in our group. And Bill had to do another selling job, just like he had to do with the 12 steps in the beginning. And he began to travel. And he traveled back in the 40s and during the Second World War, when traveling was very difficult to do, literally hundreds of thousands of miles, visiting AA groups throughout our entire country and throughout Canada to try to get them to accept these things called traditions. The usual thing was said when he came into one of those meetings was, Bill, tell us about your flash that you had in the towns, but lay off those damn traditions. We don't want to hear about them. <laughs> and it took him several years to begin to get enough people interested in them that he began to feel that he could get them approved. Finally, a decision was made to call a meeting in 1950, and that meeting was to be held in Cleveland, and it was to become the first international conference of Alcoholics Anonymous. And at that meeting were people from all over the United States, Canada, and all the other countries at that time that AA had started in and that had little general service offices of their own. And at this conference, he presented to the membership as a whole these things called traditions. The membership as a whole looked at them, voted on them, and accepted them as the second legacy of Alcoholics Anonymous, the steps being the first, now then the traditions becoming the second with the idea that if we would follow these traditions, then we could keep emotional sobriety within our groups, the same as the steps would give it to us within our own personal lives. We believe that Bill followed identically the same pattern with these traditions that he followed with the steps. I don't know whether Bill realized this is what he was doing or not. But it's quite easy to see as we look at the 12 traditions that the first tradition identifies a problem. The problem is this. How do you keep unity within your group? How do you keep from fighting with each other? How do you keep the controversy out of the group? If we fight with each other, if we have controversy about many different things, then we really don't have time to work on our own sobriety, much less help other people keep their sobriety also. So the problem becomes, how do you keep the unity? Unity is vitally important, because without the group, we're probably all going to fail. One of the great strengths of Alcoholics Anonymous is when we individuals come together and we're able to share our experiences and our knowledge and we're able to take our diverse backgrounds and meld them together in one great whole and keep ourselves sober and help other alcoholics to stay sober at the same time. Probably unity is the most cherished thing within Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, I don't know of any other fellowship in the world that gives more open license and more open reign to their members than AA. You can do about anything you want to and be a member of AA. But there is one place that we draw the line. 
If, as an individual member of AA, you begin to create controversy within our group, and you continue to create the controversy long enough, we will sacrifice the individual for the good of the whole. And I've seen it happen over and over, where finally the group conscience takes over, and we ask that individual to please leave and stay the hell out of here until he can come back with a different attitude. There is one place we will sacrifice the individual, and that is to preserve the unity. That is the most important thing we have. Now, the solution to that problem of unity is to be found within the second tradition. And the second tradition tells us this. We recognize no authority in Alcoholics Anonymous except a loving God as he expresses himself in the group conscience. The only authority in AA is a loving God expressing himself through what we hope is the informed group conscience of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, since God is the only authority, then we really don't have anything to argue about as to who's in charge and who isn't. Only God is. Now, to be sure that we keep that solution and to be sure that God is the only authority, we next have a group of traditions that we like to refer to as non-action. The steps, they are referred to as action. But in these following traditions, I think we would see within each one of them, not action but non-action. Not so much what do we do as what do we not do in order to keep this cherished thing called unity and let God be the only authority. So let's look for non-action within each of these. Joe, how about number three? <laughs> Third tradition, the first non-actions. The only require for membership is a desire to stop drinking. You know, there is a, this is one simple statement. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. So we have no other rules or guidelines about membership. And we have no other, if, if, if the only requirement is a desire to stop drinking, we should never have any argument in the group about membership. So there will be no argument about membership. In the early days, they had so many different things coming up about who can be a member of AA. And they had, they had rules about when you got drunk, you had to stay out for a year or six months. And as Charlie said, they couldn't have, some groups couldn't be any convicts. Willie's not here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, they had one rule that, well, they wouldn't let be it. Be careful now. <laughs> <laughs> I get in trouble every time I talk about this. But they had one rule that they wouldn't have any fallen women in AA. Ain't that a heck of a thing? There was a whole lot of <laughs> I don't know what they were, but I heard them talking about it. <laughs> so they had all these different rules, and there was a lot of argument about rules. So we'll just get rid of all the arguments, and we, if we don't have any discussion about rules, we can have unity on that level because the only requirement is a desire to stop drinking. So we should have no arguments about memberships. One well, of the, that, was, that was one of the biggest problems at that time. One of the things we laugh about on this is Joe said that fallen women thing one night. <laughs> <laughs> Willie was sitting right by the side of him. And some of you know Willie, big, long, Texas lady, fine lady. And Joe said Willie could not have been a man. <laughs> <laughs> and she looked at him and said, Honey, <laughs> I believe you have it mixed up. <laughs> it always amazes me today. This rule regarding membership. <coughs> The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. That is so simple, yet today we sit around and argue about who can and who cannot be. You know, somebody says, 
I'm an alcoholic and a drug addict. And somebody immediately says, you can't be a member of AA. Somebody says, I'm an alcoholic and a something else. And they say, you can't be a member of AA. No, the only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. Anybody, anywhere, anytime that's willing to state they have a desire to stop drinking is automatically a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> they can be anything they want to be as long as they have a desire to stop drinking. You know, this tradition is meant to be inclusive rather than exclusive. In the beginning, they tried to exclude people because of fear. But as time went by, they began to see those fears were ungrounded. So they began to say, well, hell, let's don't keep them out. Let's try to bring them in. And they made this tradition as inclusive as they can possibly be. You can be an alcoholic and uh, anything you want to be. If you have a desire to stop drinking, you are automatically a member of AA if you say you are a member of AA. And I'm glad that's true. I would hate to be on the group committee that votes on who can and who cannot be a member of AA. I would hate to be in the judgment business and try to determine which alcoholic can be and which one cannot. You don't have to be a pure alcoholic to be a member of AA as long as you have a desire to stop drinking. Number four also has a non-action within it, John. Yeah, thanks. I'm just thinking about them fallen women. I'm glad they let them in. <laughs> they make some of the best AA members you've ever seen in your life. Fourth tradition, uh, and you got to say this about traditions. You know that uh, the traditions are just having a little flashback. <laughs> <laughs> Not a blackout this time, a real flashback. <laughs> John said he didn't have Alzheimer's disease. He's got sometimes disease. <laughs> the thing we haven't said yet that is that with these traditions, they were born out of experience. They weren't just set out and dreamed up as rules and regulations. These traditions, all of them, came from the experience that we had. And so that we finally set down these principles which said if we can agree on these things, we won't have anything to argue about, and if we don't argue, we will stay unified. And this particular tradition, it says that each group should be autonomous except in matters affecting other groups or AA as a whole. And what that simply means is that if some of you, probably in your home area and as you travel, you see that a lot of groups operate in a lot of different ways. Some of them are speaker meetings, some of them are step meetings, some of them are open meetings, some of them are closed meetings. And thank God we don't have to write to some central office and say, we want to start a group, what's open? We can determine ourselves what it is we want to do. And the only, the only flag about it is that we do not, uh, that we do not any, do anything that would harm other groups in the area or Alcoholics Anonymous as a whole. But we are, as groups, are free to choose our destiny and our direction. We are autonomous. And it implies that, that groups can make mistakes too. Just like we, uh, that, just like we have a four step inventory. Sometimes we groups need to take an inventory about what they're all about. The non-action involved in that particular tradition is simply that no one group can tell any other group what to do. And people always ask the question, well, how do you know if you're going to hurt other groups or AA as a whole? And my usual answer is, if you're breaking traditions, then you may be harming not only your group but other groups, and also AA as a whole. And as long as what you're doing is not breaking an AA tradition, you're free to do anything that you want to do. And even if you did do one breaking an AA tradition, nobody has any authority to discipline the group anyhow. You know, the group really is the authority as a loving God expressing himself through that group conscience. Joe number five has a non-action in it. What is that? Number five, each group has one primary purpose to carry its message to the alcoholic who still suffers. Now this uh, non-action, it, it spells out the purpose of the group. Uh, and this is a singular purpose. Um, and uh, one primary purpose. That's the one purpose of the group. 
carry out message to other alcoholics. And if the group about uh, will follow their tradition, there will be no, no argument in the groups about what they're going to do. Um, you know, if somebody brings in the group an idea to help the Girl Scouts, <laughs> you know, then somebody over here said, no, I want to help the Boy Scouts. And then the other one would say, well, we need to be doing this. And the other one say, well, then they, oh, I'd rather do this. And so there's an argument about what the group, well, we don't do any of those things. But carry our message to, so we are single, we have a single purpose. And this is a binding factor. This is a single purpose of the AA group. So there should be no other arguments about doing other things. So therefore there will be unity in the group on the, on the purpose of, on the purpose level. Our non-action involved in here is we simply don't do anything except <laughs> one thing. The group carries its message to the alcoholic who still suffers. Number six, what's the non-action there, John? An AA group ought never endorse, finance, or lend the AA name to any related facility or outside enterprise unless problems of money, property, and prestige divert us from our primary purpose. Towards outside agencies dealing with alcoholism, the AA policy is cooperation but not affiliation. AA members employed by outside agencies wear two hats, but Tradition 6 cautions any such members against wearing both at once. On the job, they may be alcoholism counselors. They are not AA counselors. At meetings, they're just AAs, not alcoholism experts. <coughs> here, here. And the non-action involved here is simply, we never endorse finance or lead the AA name to any related facility, period. And if we don't do that, we have nothing to fight about. Unity has to prevail because of that. How about the non-action in number seven, Joe? Every AA group ought to be fully self-supported and declaring outside contribution. And I think that this is, you know, this keeps that. This is truly one that can cause controversy. See, uh, if we, we, we are self-supported, we support ourselves as we pass the hat. Everything in AA is we self-supported. Because if we take someone else's money and they support us, then they're going to tell us what we're going to have to do. And I think, you know, that's the one thing that I always love about Alcoholics Anonymous, and I feel very strongly about supporting my group and supporting everything in Alcoholics Anonymous because as Charlie, as we just talked about here this weekend, you know, that we did get some money from Rockefeller, but we paid him back. In fact, we have paid, we don't know, we have paid all those people back. We don't owe them any money. You know, and Alcoholics Anonymous is, those of us who don't realize what we're really a part of, I'm really proud to be a, a member of Alcoholics Anonymous because of that. You know, you look around the world today and around our country and you turn on your TV and you pick up your newspapers and you think about all the great programs around the world and how much money they raise from the general public. You know, they, they always ask them for money. You know, Alcoholics Anonymous has, has performed a service for millions of people and has never asked the general public for one penny. That's what makes me proud to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I wonder, people think a lot of Alcoholics Anonymous, everybody all over the world, Public officials and everybody, they think a great deal of alcoholics and I'm, I wonder if we, if we really got on the TVs and things, I wonder how much money we, could we raise? <laughs> we could raise billions of dollars and it would destroy us. Okay. I think I'm real proud that we support ourselves. And that's what, you know, when that basket is passed, that's what I want to be a part of because I'm really proud that we support ourselves. I think that's one of the reasons we need to be very careful when we're dealing with our so-called AA clubhouses, yeah. with our treatment centers, yeah. with people who work in and out of those. We all have the responsibility that regardless of what that facility is, we never use the AA name in order to try to raise funds for those facilities. And once in a while they do that. And when they do so, it looks to the general public 
And here's a bunch of drunks that's got their hands sticking out again. We run into a very interesting story over in England. There was a member of AA who was quite wealthy, who died a couple of years ago in England, and he left within his will several, several thousand pounds to Alcoholics Anonymous. And of course, their general service office, just like ours, in complying with their tradition, refused to accept the money. We simply cannot do that. Within a relatively short period of time, a solicitor for the family filed a lawsuit against AA to force them to take the money. Now, in England, there is a law that if you are a private, non-profit corporation, and if you accept funds from any source, you must accept them from all sources, and you don't have the right to turn it down. So the upshot of that was that AA, through some very, very friendly people, went through Parliament and had a special law passed to dispense AA from that particular law. <laughs> it's going to happen here in the United States just as sure as anything. It hasn't happened yet. But we've got two or three that are on the verge today of filing the lawsuit. And sooner or later, it'll probably, we'll probably have to do the same thing. There, they wanted to keep that tradition so badly that they actually went through Parliament and got a special dispensation from that law so they could remain self-supporting. <laughs> Number eight. What would be the dawn action in eight, John? Number eight. <laughs> Alcoholics Anonymous should remain forever non-professional, but our service centers may employ special workers. That means that we don't get paid for doing 12-step work, and we have certain centers like intergroup offices, central offices, general service office, in which we have to hire employees to see that 12-step work can be done, secretaries and staff members, et cetera, et cetera. And so we, we do hire certain workers, male people in the mailroom, and we pay them accordingly. But for our service, for our work, we never get paid for 12-step work. And if we could agree on that, we won't have anything to argue about. Hmm. Besides, who's going to determine how much Anthony's going to charge and how much I'm going to charge? We'd be fighting about it. <laughs> <laughs> who's going to determine who gets paid and who doesn't? That's right. Yeah. How about number nine, Joe, non-action? The next non-action, AA as such, are never be organized. And we can hear about the non. We never. So, I, mean, uh, I love this and I uh, wonder why we even have it. Uh, I think it's totally impossible to organize it anyway. <laughs> you ain't going to organize this outfit very much. But we may create a service boards committee directly responsible for the, uh, for those they serve. Uh, as we say, we are not an organization. We're not organized. Uh, I'll never be organized. Well, we have to have committees and, and uh, groups to perform our, our functions. Well, you know, we have an organization, that means you're going to have to have somebody at the head of it, and AA is not an organization, it's a fellowship. In order to maintain an organization, you have to have certain rules. In order to have rules, you have to have a certain penalty. And uh, so we are not an organization as such, we're a fellowship. But in order to function, though, we have to have, serve, we have, to have committees and groups of us to carry out the, the, the functions uh, of the fellowship. These people we elect to do these jobs for us are referred to as trusted servants. They have no authority, period, as far as being able to discipline or telling anybody in the fellowship what they need to do. They simply serve in that particular capacity. Number 10, John, non-action. Charlie Joe's complaining that he's got more than I do. Well, good for him. I'm glad he does. <laughs> Just worked out that way. We'll fix him up on concepts. Okay, good. <laughs> the tenth tradition, Alcoholics Anonymous has no no opinion. No, there's a no, none, and all that. Opinion on outside issues. Hence, the AA name ought never be drawn into public controversy. Think about how smooth it would be in here if we could all agree with that. No outside issues. And I think about what is the primary purpose. Tradition 5 tells us what our conversation is all about. Nothing but that. So if we can agree that we don't have any opinions on outside issues and we don't bring outside issues 
into our meetings, then we won't have anything to argue about. But I guarantee you one thing, as soon as we do, we do. That's it, I mean, that's... <laughs> if we start talking about politics, yeah, religion. politics, if we start talking about religion, okay. if we start talking about other controversial issues with NAA, then surely we're going to have a hell of a fight within a hurry. Because I don't know of anybody that loves that stuff any more than we do. And it would literally destroy us within a very short period of time. Okay, number 11. What's the non-action there, Joe? Our public relations power is based on attraction rather than promotion. We need to always maintain personnel to the level of press, radio, and film. I think this is quite obvious, you know, because we get in all kind of arguments about who's going to represent the group on TV. And, <laughs> and one would want them to be doing it. It would be a lot of confusion. So this is a non-action. If we get it, we don't get into these things. There won't be any controversy in the group. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.